to my channel. Today's video is going to be the second video in my Serial Killer mini-series. You guys were so excited last week when I announced this would be the topic of this month's mini-series, so I'm especially excited to do today's video on my personal favorite serial killer, as absolutely strange as that kind of sounds. Today's serial killer we are going to be talking about is H.H. H. Holmes, but that was not the name he was given at birth. H.H. H. Holmes is one of America's very first serial killers, and he's also known as the Beast of Chicago. And he's mainly known because of his murder castle. I mean, there have been documentaries done on him, there have been movies based off of his murder castle, there have been television shows based off the murder castle. That's pretty much what he's known for. However, he seemed to have a fairly normal upbringing. H.H. H. Holmes was born May 16th of 1861. He was actually born under the name of Herman Webster Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Now, his family had a farm, he was the youngest of three. As I said before, he had a pretty average life. He was incredibly intelligent from a young age, and now this is where a lot of things are going to be just like the Bell Gunness video where it's so old so we don't really know, so there's multiple different stories. Just keep that in mind from here on out. There are many different things that people claim happened, claimed he did, claimed were found, and we don't really know, so I'm going to go with like the least inflated story. It is said, despite his pretty good upbringing, him being intelligent and having friends, leading an average life, he was bullied a lot, and his biggest fear, according to some people, was doctors. Now, and these specific kids that bullied him one day forced him to stand in front of a human skeleton in a doctor's office and stare at it. Now they were laughing. They thought this was the greatest, most hysterical thing in the world. And at first he was absolutely terrified, but somehow his terror morphed into absolute fascination. And that's when his life gets a little bit strange. It is said he started to practice surgery on animals all of the time because of his fascination. It's also said that he might have killed one of his childhood friends. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these stories you don't see in a lot of places, and many people think these were just kind of fluffed up and made to make it look like H.H. H. Holmes fit the patterns and stereotypes of a serial killer. At the age of 16, he graduated from high school and started taking odd jobs around the town. And then on July 4th of 1878, he married a young woman named Clara. And then in February of 1880, they had a son. In 1882, two years after his son was born, he decided to go to college. He applied at the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, where he would later graduate in 1884. He then apprenticed a teacher that was the chief of anatomy, and more bizarre things started happening and this is again where he starts showing traits of being a serial killer. While he was working under this chief of anatomy they had a lot of access to bodies and a morgue and he would take these bodies home with him. Um, he apparently would take them, dissect them in his free time, and sometimes he even decided to file insurance claims with them. Now again, these are some facts that a lot of people say probably aren't true, but they match up to a lot of the things that he did later in life. Now at this point, his wife Clara had left him. Apparently he had a lot of violent tendencies, but this didn't stop him in any way, shape, or form, and he seemed kind of unbothered by it. Then in 1885, after bouncing around from a bunch of different odd jobs, moved to Chicago where he went under his famous alias name as Henry Howard Holmes. He did in fact pursue quite a few legitimate businesses, um, I'll get more into that later, but he did. I think he had a copying business, he had a few other things, but every single one of them seemed to fail. So that's what I guess you could say he kind of started to choose his own cards in life instead of just dealing with the ones he was dealt. Despite never actually legally finishing up the marriage with Clara, he <laughs> went on and married another woman. So now at this point, he had two wives. Soon after he married Myrda in 1886, he started working at a pharmacy named Elizabeth S. Holton's Pharmacy in Inglewood, Chicago. So he eventually owned this pharmacy on his own. There are some rumors that he killed the owner of it and that's the only reason he gained ownership but it's been later proven that they actually stayed pretty close for a fairly long amount of time. He did in fact buy this business on his own, so that was yet another part of his story where it was kind of just made more interesting than it actually was. However, 
don't worry because he starts to make his own story very interesting at this point. So later on in 1886, he decided to start building what's now known as the murder castle across from the pharmacy. He said it would be apartments, some retail spaces, and a brand new drugstore. So he last minute decided to add on a third floor. He said this third floor was supposed to be for a hotel, but it was never completed legally, I guess you could say. And so he ended up just turning it into his own apartment, or that is what he told everybody. Now we're gonna talk about what exactly was going on on the inside of this building, and it will give you goosebumps up your spine. I am sure most of you probably already know a lot about it, but let's go ahead and dive right on in. So when he was constructing this building, he knew specifically what he was actually constructing it for, and he was basically creating his own playground to murder and torture people. There were over 100 rooms, I believe it was on the second floor. Most were windowless completely, there were secret passageways, there were false floors, trap doors, chutes, vaults, all sorts of crazy things. There were stairs that led to absolutely nowhere, there were hinged walls. Most rooms had gas vents in them that pretty much were controlled by Holmes apartment uh, space upstairs. There were also very weird empty spaces that were used for something because they also had gas vents in them, but they would be like really small spaces in the floor. So let's say he took the second floor, added a couple of inches to it and left this empty space in between and then sectioned it off, almost like he would open up a trap door, throw a body in this like small space and then gas them. Also, most of the rooms were soundproofed and as well, most of them only locked from the outside. Even had a trap door cut in his own bathroom that led down a very narrow hallway to a short set of stairs that led to literally a black hole that went straight through all of the floors directly to the basement, and that is how he disposed of all of his bodies. While he was making this entire murder castle, I don't understand why no one questioned him, but literally no one did. His wife didn't even know what was going on at this point, or should I say his second wife didn't even know what was going on at this point. He was such a smooth talker, and he could always pretty much just like entrance anyone, and he was so intelligent that you would get lost in the words he was saying and just pretty much go with whatever he told you. As well as being a murder castle, he was also basically having it made for free because he was quite the swindler. So you know, the furniture suppliers, the different suppliers that gave him all of the materials to build this, the people who were building it, all the different companies basically just sat and waited for their money. As, as I said before, he had failed other businesses. He didn't have just all this money to be making this. So he basically just lied to everyone and would pin everyone against each other. He would turn things around and almost make it seem like the supplier did something wrong in order to basically never have to pay anything. Investigators started getting a little suspicious of this activity. He would file different insurance claims on other items and he would get that money and pay back another supplier just to say something went wrong to get that money back. It just became very, very suspicious. So all of the investors eventually started a plan to completely pull out of the deal, leaving him basically alone to pay for absolutely everything. And then on August 13th of 1893, conveniently enough for Holmes, the whole third floor of his building caught fire. Just taken out insurance policies on the building and he walked away with a good chunk of money but not before having his fun in the building first. So now is where we're gonna to start to talk about some of the victims from inside the building. I also think now is a good time to say that we have no idea how many people he killed inside his murder castle. To this day, it's guessed that he killed anywhere from 20 to 200 people, and I'll get more into that evidence later. So while the building was in his prime, his first target or victim was Julia Smith. Her husband had taken a job at the jewelry shop, so she ended up moving into the building, and this was one of his main ways of getting his victims to come in. He would offer them some sort of work, tell them that he would put them up in a room in the building so they didn't have to travel anywhere or, you know, pay any extra expenses, and that obviously sounds great, and people are going to jump at it. And that's exactly what happened here. So then he played another one of his tricks where he tried to swoon Julia, and eventually they started having an affair. And when her husband found out, he was obviously 
and raged, he quit his job and he left completely. And Julia decided to stay with Holmes. However, she had no idea what kind of a man he actually was. He was a very handsome, like I said, smooth talking, charismatic man. And every girl was just tripping over themselves over him. And he knew he had that in his favor. He installed electric buzzers through the entire building on doors, stairs, everywhere he could. So whenever anyone, basically at this point, just her, was approaching him, he would be able to stop whatever he's doing, conceal whatever he's doing, and basically keep his little murder castle a secret. Because to this point, everyone still thinks he's just running a regular building with lots of businesses. Then on Christmas Eve of 1891, she disappeared. Holmes later reported that she died of an abortion, but this was never actually confirmed. And then Emmeline Sigrand became his second known victim. She started working in the building in May of 1892, and under the same similar circumstances, she just kind of disappeared. And another woman, Edna Tassel, started working under the building in the same circumstances yet again, and she also disappeared. Meanwhile, still, his wife was at home, had no idea what was going on. I don't know how he managed to split his time between this murder castle and these females that loved him and wanted his attention and then still went home, ran multiple businesses, you know, kept himself safe from all these insurance companies and companies he owed money. And then to make it even crazier, he would still somehow find time in all this to go travel places like Texas, you know, short little business trips. He managed to steal a horse down there and had a warrant out for his arrest. He managed to meet a couple of other people down there and how did he juggle all of this? It's absolutely insane. Then in 1893, before the fire, is when he decided to open his business to the public and created a hotel. Now there's some evidence that this hotel was never actually legitimate. He just advertised it as so to bring in these victims. We honestly don't even know what he did in these rooms or if he had any torture devices or you know anything about what actually happened inside of this murder castle because he was so secretive about it and everything was planned inside the building itself so meticulously that he could hide absolutely everything and dispose of the bodies in such a way that we really weren't even able to find anything when it was finally searched. He then met a man named Benjamin Pitzel. I'm probably saying that man's last name wrong. But Benjamin soon became his right-hand man in all of his other crimes. He helped him with all sorts of scheming and he basically just did whatever he was asked to do. Now, he didn't murder anyone or, you know, really know what was happening in the murder castle, but unfortunately, he would eventually fall as one of Holmes' victims. Also in 1893, he met a woman named Minnie Williams. Now, Minnie Williams was a small actress. I think she only had one part somewhere, but they both kind of fell in love with each other. And after a few months, he moved her into his murder castle and gave her a job opportunity there. She wrote many letters to her sister and family saying she was head over heels, absolutely in love, talking about how great this man was. However, at this point, he was going by a completely different alias to her, so her family knew him as, I think it was like Henry or something crazy. And he somehow persuaded her to sign over her estate that she had in Texas to this random man named Alexander Bond. However, this random Alexander Bond wasn't so random because it was actually just another one of Holmes' aliases. So how he managed to convince this woman to literally sign over her entire estate to a stranger, this is how manipulative and smart he was. After she did this, he ended up marrying her. She brought her sister down. They were supposed to go over to Europe. However, they were never seen again. There are some stories that say that he claims they were fighting over him and eventually Minnie killed her sister and then killed herself. I mean, there are all sorts of crazy stories out there as to what happened. Obviously, that's like something out of a movie. This actress comes to his murder castle, falls in love with her, says they're going over to Europe and then both of them die. Like it's, it's obviously something a lot of people can use for really fluffed up entertainment. However, things were slowly starting to catch up to him at this point. The insurance companies were not stupid. They were starting to really realize what was going on. The companies were coming to them. Everyone kind of realized he'd been pinning them on each other and they started to plan to take him down for arson, which pushed him to leave Chicago in 1894. But don't worry, 
He knew this was gonna happen, so he went to the estate he took over in Texas. He actually ended up in jail very shortly after his arrival, and this is where he met a man named Marion Hedgepeth, and this man was known as, I think, the handsome bandit in Texas. He was literally one of those like Wild West train thieves. Like, it's absolutely crazy. And they decided to make a plan of Holmes faking his death when he got out and claiming $10,000 in life insurance and splitting it between the both of them. And they had planned this entire thing meticulously. Now, Holmes was getting out of jail a lot earlier than Hedgepath. So the plan was he would go do his thing. Hedgepath would eventually claim the money and they would split it. Everything was going to be fine but he was kind of already under the microscope and he didn't do things exactly as planned. So the insurance company caught on to him and he had to immediately abort mission. However, being the man he was, he was not about to give up on $10,000. That's when he decided to alter the plan a little bit and bring in his old friend, Benjamin Pitzel. Pitzel agreed to do this and he was going to be technically the one whose death was faked. And the only reason he agreed to it was because he had five children and they obviously could use the money so he said he would do it if that meant he got one big portion of the money they would still give hedge path i think it was about five hundred dollars just for helping with the idea but holmes and pitzel were going to take most of the money they concocted a scheme that benjamin would go under the name of bf perry as an inventor who died in this elaborate lab explosion. Holmes' job was supposed to be to find a body because we all know how great he is at doing that. His wife was going to, you know, confirm the body that was Pitzel so they could all take the insurance money. However, Holmes decided to not go too far for that body he needed and just decided to go ahead and kill Benjamin anyway. He ended up chloroforming Benjamin and set his body on fire threw him into this area that was supposed to be an explosion and called it a day. Holmes then used one of Benjamin's daughters to basically describe very specific things about Benjamin that you would be able to identify him by. Little did she know that was her actual dad that they were identifying. They claimed that her mother was too sick to come and identify the body, so he escorted her there and everything was pretty much identified as is and they were given the money. However, he wasn't done scheming yet because he still had to share this money and he was not very happy about it. So his new scheme was against Pitzel's wife. Now he somehow managed to convince her to take three of her children into his custody. He informed her that Benjamin was off in London and hiding, trying to stay down low, and that they were going to split up to make it seem less suspicious and travel random places and then eventually end up in London. So he took three of the children, I think it was the three very middle children, and left the youngest and the oldest with Pitzel's wife. He traveled all over the United States with these three children and then he would simultaneously just leave them there, like find a house for them to stay in go back he got Pitzel's wife and the two other children and then started taking them all over the United States while the other children are basically just waiting for him to show back up. There was one point where the three children and the mom and the other two children were within blocks of each other you know thinking that the others were somewhere completely different. The entire time he was lying about where the other three children were, um, still lying about where her husband was, and was just like moving them around like pawns on a game board. It's absolutely crazy. And then to top it all off, not only was he doing that with six separate people, he also was then at the end of the night going home and staying with his wife. So it's like absolutely insane how he managed to have so many people under his control and doing exactly what he wanted. They were all falling for it. No one was questioning a thing. And how he had time to do all of this, I have no idea. He eventually took the three children to the Canadian border where he killed the two girls that he had. And he ended up burying them in the cellar of a home he had in Toronto. Now, people are really starting to realize what he was doing when it comes to insurance fraud. No one really even had any idea at this point that he had just been killing people. So a man named Frank Geyer was a private investigator from Philadelphia that had been trying to track where Holmes was going. Because at this point, Marion Hedgepeth was very angry, he had not received his money yet, so to get back at Holmes, he went to the police about it and told them exactly what their new plan was, said that it was supposed to be Pitzel, said that he was owed money and Holmes never showed back up with it, but they didn't really have anything on Holmes himself other than a random warrant from somewhere. So they tracked down Pitzel's wife and brought her in 
And that's when she found out that it actually was her husband that was killed and she completely unwound. Like she lost her mind. She said she had been traveling all over the place. She had been in hiding. He had promised so many things. So then because of this, they were able to track him down. He ended up confessing to the insurance fraud, but he refused to say he had anything to do with Pitzel's death. He said, I swear it was a different person. He must have another scheme going on. They basically only got him because there were some crazy science things that didn't add up. They knew that the person that died there had died right there. And he was claiming he took this random body from somewhere else and brought it in. And that didn't line up with the facts of how they found Pitzel. So this is the only thing that actually 100% connected him to Pitzel's murder because he was not about to confess to it. That then led them to look for these children. She did not know still where three of her children were. So in 1895, Geyer went to his home that he had in Toronto and that's where he uncovered the bodies of the two young girls that belonged to the Pitzel family. But they still didn't know where the young boy was. He eventually tracked Holmes' movements to Indianapolis, where Holmes had gone into a pharmacy under his H.H. Holmes name and got some sort of prescription that he ended up killing the little boy with. He also went to different places in town to get his knives sharpened. I'm sure you can guess what he did with those. And then they finally found the house he had been staying at, and unfortunately they found the teeth and a few bones in the fireplace of the home, and they belonged to the little boy. So not only had he killed Benjamin Pitzel, but he now had three children that he killed, and this led them to immediately go and check out his murder castle. Now, keep in mind, at this point, they were expecting to catch him for insurance fraud. They weren't expecting to catch him actually killing some people. They're terrified at this point, and I've seen multiple different accounts of what exactly happened when they went to the murder castle. I've seen some things say that no one ever actually found anything. They just found the bizarre structure, and the way he set up the inside really suggests he was torturing people, capturing them. I mean, he had a place to dump bodies. It all made sense. And the first woman that he ended up killing, the one that was having an affair with him, her husband left, she had a daughter with her at the time. And according to some people, the daughter's bones were in fact found in the murder castle. Now, there was some sort of world fair going on around the time that all of this was happening in Chicago. So they started to dig even deeper because at this point they knew more things happened in this hotel and that's when they realized there was an alarming amount of disappearances in this time frame. Not a normal amount for Chicago in general, like an absolutely huge amount of people, which is where they got the 200 number from. On October of 1895, he was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Pitzel, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. After being convicted, he confessed up to 27 murders. However, this was just another one of his schemes, or was it? We really don't know. Apparently, a newspaper offered him a large amount of money to confess to the people he had killed. He was becoming this sort of sensationalized human being. No one had seen really anything anything like this before. And so he just, you know, kind of went off with all of these names, calculating it up to 27 people. However, he also was being paid for it. And pretty soon after they realized majority of these people were still alive. So he had essentially from jail still been conning people. And at this point, he really just started messing with everyone. It was again, like a little game to him. He started saying that he was Satan. He started making up all these crazy contradicting life stories. I mean, he had like four different lives he supposedly lived and it changed based on who he was talking to. So they didn't really even know at this point what from him to take as fact. So that made it that much harder to figure out how many people exactly he had killed. Then on May 7th, 1896, he was put to death by hanging. And now this was described as an absolutely chilling and horrific event. Um, this might be a little bit graphic just to let you know. When you hang, usually you die because your neck snaps. It's not suffocation. However, his neck didn't snap. So he hung there, slowly dying for 20, minutes and a lot of people say it was the strangest most gruesome thing to watch which is completely understandable he took back most of his confessions he said he only killed two people and everyone who was there said he remained eerily calm the entire time he didn't seem scared 
He didn't seem upset. Really had zero emotions on his face. Something interesting that I found is that he actually asked for a very specific way to be buried. And I find it interesting given the things he did when he was alive. He has to be buried in a coffin 10 feet down and covered with cement because he had a fear that robbers would come take his body and dissect it, which is interestingly enough, what he did to other people. So I find it very bizarre that he himself had that own fear. I think maybe because he knew what kind of lack of respect you have to have for someone to do that and he wanted everyone to respect him. But it's just the craziest thing to me. And there are so many other facets of this story. There are so many versions of the story, so many things you can watch. If I kept going now, this video would end up being over an hour long. Through his entire life, he managed to raise three children while doing all of this, um, be married to three different wives. He somehow went home to two of those wives simultaneously while also having a mistress, while also having a murder castle, while also holding off all these crazy people coming after him for money and committing and scheming insurance frauds left and right. I find it so interesting and heartbreaking all at the same time that there are possibly 200 people that he killed that there will be no justice for really. There will be no answers for their families. Other than distant relatives, there's no one really alive to care anymore. And I hate to say that, but you know, so many mothers and fathers and sisters and friends had to live their life having no idea what happened to their loved one because this man was so sick. And what's even crazier is what's happening to current day. And I'm not going to really talk about much of it in this video. If you guys want a whole separate video on it, I mean, give me all the thumbs up in the world and let me know down below so I can do it. But there are actually accusations going around that he somehow managed to escape his execution. So literally 2017, last year, like we were just in 2017, Holmes' body was exhumed for testing. I kid you not, that's how convinced they were that he might possibly have escaped his execution. There was a show that was going on about him and the co-host was actually his great-great-grandson. Now his great-great-grandson was named Jeff Medgett and he actually inherited two diaries that belonged to Holmes that talked about very interesting things. They had entries in them describing multiple murder and mutilations of prostitutes in London. Does that sound familiar? Because it sounds to me like Jack the Ripper. Basically, we are still so scared of this man and that he might have gotten away that even as recent as 2017, we are digging him up just to make sure he is really dead in his grave. Like that's crazy to me. When he was exhumed because of the way they had cemented over him, it actually held up his clothing almost perfectly. He still had his perfect mustache, which I find so creepy, um, but everything except for his actual body really was completely preserved and looked like it had not been touched. Just absolutely insane, all this man did. And I feel like when you single everything out, it's crazy, but you know, we see unfortunately some things like that to this day, but I think it's just the fact that he juggled all of that and he had wives who he came home to and they had no idea what was going on. Like I couldn't ever imagine, you know, my husband just going out and doing that stuff and me never, you know, having any idea and just carrying on as usual. Meanwhile, he's got like a couple other wives, has been to a couple other states, is like carrying children around to different places and hiding them and killing them. Like it's just, it's insane. I think it's just the fact that he did all of this so seamlessly without anyone ever questioning it. That's so crazy. Let me know what you guys think down below. Let me know if you have any suggestions for serial killers you want to see, non-active ones again. <laughs> And thank you guys so much for watching this video. Don't forget to give it a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button to become a member of the family, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys.